Um, let me go ahead and start off. We are recording, and I'll start off by reading a little intro about Karen. She's a superstar in my mind, but let's just go ahead through her official bio. Karen started her career as an engineer in Silicon Valley and grew up through the product management ranks into profit and loss leadership. She has worked in several industries in Silicon Valley. Along the way, she became very interested in gender differences and started researching not just what they were, but also how they impact behavior on the workplace. Karen has a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Science in Engineering and an MBA from Santa Clara University. Just before the pandemic descended, she published her first book, You Can't Fix What You Can't See, an eye-opening toolkit for cultivating gender harmony in business. And by the way, I have read her book. It's on my Kindle. Amazing, amazing. She offers consulting services to companies who want to become more gender savvy in order to maximize innovation, growth, and engagement. And heads up for anybody who is in a male dominated industry, such as the auto repair industry, such as the construction industry, such as a lot of the industries that Rockstar Marketing works with, this is a really, really important presentation to listen to because it's going to help you unlock the key of creating great cultural harmony within your team. Yes. So please welcome Karen with her workshop, Gendered Mindsets, Unlocking What You Can't See. Yay! Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate it. Oh, by the way, it's so weird to be talking and the you are muted button keeps standing up in front of me. So um, if I have to weird, you'll know why. My goal today is to offer you a framework, a framework that can allow you to stop tripping over gender differences and to start leveraging them. And to understand the framework, I'm going to use Dynhop, where we look at behavior that's on opposite ends of the spectrum. And we're going to use examples like problem solving and information exchange, things that happen all the time at work, to exemplify this. And why do we want to do this? We want to do this because everyone knows that diversity is really important in the workplace and it is the way to get to uh, more innovation, more growth, and more engagement. But there's two requirements to make diversity work in your company. The first requirement is you have to get the diversity in the door. And we've been working on that for a long time, and we know how to measure this. I don't know, there can't possibly be anyone here who has not filled out one of those EEOC, right? A check, are you what, you know, what's your race, what's your gender, what's your, right? We fill those out all the time. We don't even think about it anymore. So we're really good at measuring diversity. But the second component that's really important for this is inclusion. And that means I can be in the building, but people don't listen to me. People don't talk to me. There's the communication is, is fractured. And then I can't put my all into it because it won't even be received. And that is not a good thing. So the second piece is that we really need to work on the, the inclusion piece. And that's where most of my work lies. Now I wanted to share just, um, just last May, uh, McKinsey finally put out, they looked at, we've been measuring diversity for a long time, but how included do your employees feel? It's not so easy to measure, and there certainly isn't a standard for what that looks like. But McKinsey last year came up with a way to look at diversity and inclusion, and to look at relative to each other how they were. It was unique. They, they went through sites like Glassdoor, and indeed, you know, where, where people can talk about the companies that they work for or how the interview process went and those kinds of things. And they look at all the comments about companies and they categorize them. And is this about diversity? Is this about inclusion? And is it positive, negative, or neutral? And so they got a comparison where you can compare apples to apples. And I found it absolutely fascinating because I think we all know this. The sentiment on diversity was 31% negative. The sentiment on inclusion was 61% negative. 
So clearly inclusion is one of the areas we really, really need to push on. And it's hard, it's hard to measure and it's hard to know what is it that makes people feel included. But that's part of what we're going to talk about today because it's really important. And it is amazing the difference you can get out of people when they feel included. The things they will do. I mean, it, I'm not kidding when I say I have seen people leap tall buildings in a single bound when they really felt like they were part of the team. It makes a huge amount of difference. Hey, Karen, before yeah. we begin, I know that you're using this streaming software, but because you're not the primary speaker, you're stuff is really really tiny there's no way we can see those graphs so uh, is it possible that we can't can you pin me or highlight me i don't know what to be there's no way to do that honey i need you to use go to meeting and not your software in uh, order for this Jennifer. presentation to really work Lights, Jennifer. They're all in the software. oh geez okay well if you can explain in very, very uh, clear terms what we're supposed to see, because we can't okay. see it. Okay, there's not too many charts, so I think we'll be all right. Okay, cool. So what are we looking at with these? What do these things say? I just, I just went through that. You saw negative comments on diversity is 31%, and negative comments on inclusion is 61%. Oh, somebody just put a note in the chat. Oh, okay. Presenter view. Okay. Let's look it in presenter could, view. Could be in presenter view. Maybe it, it's better. Uh, go ahead and go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, Brian. I was just going to say, like, when I hit presenter view, it just shows you, Jennifer, because the audio is coming through yours. I can't. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. That's why it won't blow up. That's her why screen. it won't blow up because she has to come through me. Okay. Well, anyway, just just know that your presentation, okay, okay. we can't see it. So, cool. But anyway, great stuff. Keep going. Let's keep going. Oh, okay, good. Where are they? Oh, good. We're about to shift anyway. I love a good comment. And you might not be able to read this, but it's a guy who just got out of his car parked in front of a gas station and a mechanic who's wiping his hands. And the guy says, my wife insisted I stop and ask someone for directions. Could you just pretend that you're giving them to me? Now, I love a good cartoon just because I love a good cartoon, but why do some people have so much trouble asking for directions? And this is the part where it's gonna be um, kind of interesting to do. So let's have people, if you are always comfortable asking for directions, can you please raise your hand? Okay, there's a lot of people very comfortable. If you are not comfortable asking for directions, can you raise your hand? Too funny, isn't it? And that was one of the problems that I discovered when I started doing uh, work on gender. The natural thing to do, of course, would be to describe things with men and women, right? But what I found is that is extremely polarizing, and it makes it really hard to get work done. And it leaves out whole groups of people in addition. But the part that I think really got to me the worst was when I discovered that I was coming out of man on many of these scales. And that was from, well, is it because I spent years in tech? Or was it because I was interested in those tech kind of things? And that was what I, you know, and, and so that was my proclivity to start with, you know, this chicken or egg question. But what I found is you really don't have to make it matter. It really, that, that part doesn't, doesn't really matter. And I started to shift my perspective and I said, perhaps, it's not about gender, but it's about gender stereotypes, but it's really about a mindset. It's about where your head is with that. And so I want you to start thinking and I'll invite you to shift your mindset as we go through this conversation. I'd like to introduce a framework to you today that I found incredibly helpful. The only thing that I really, really wish had been different 
was that someone had handed me this framework when I first started work. Because here I am toward the other end of my career, and now I have this beautiful framework that certainly would have saved me a lot of trouble and pain from years and years because I've collected these over many years. And it's years of trial and error. Right? I mean, none of this was found out the easy way. Everything involved tripping and falling on my face, generally. <laughs> so I want you to suppose that there are only two kinds of people in the world. And they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. And, you know, our brains are designed to, to see patterns. And when you look at a collection of patterns, they will often merge into a mindset or a set of attitudes about things. Who here is familiar with the work of Carol Dweck? Oh, yeah. I've read oh, that I book. And yes, in the chat, we definitely, Nicola's read her. And by the way, if, if you've noticed, we all figured it out. Thank you, Christopher. We figured out that if we take off our camera views, you are the one that pops up. And then suddenly we can see you if we have it oh, under view yes. active cameras. Yeah, so now you're big if, when, when we're under the view active cameras setting in GoToMeeting. So we're all good. Excellent. You guys are so smart. I'll have to figure out what went sideways with this software, but we'll do that later. <laughs> so Carol Black introduced mindsets or reintroduced that word into the American lexicon anyway. And she talked about fixed mindsets and growth mindsets. But there are mindsets about all kinds of things. There are mindsets are often about our perception. And when we have these mindsets, it colors our perception. It colors our total world. There's a, there's a great uh, book, what is it, Whistling the Vandalbe, that was written by a black man who liked to take walks in the evening. And he found that many people would walk to the other side of the street. They were afraid of him. And he started whistling classic music. And suddenly people stopped changing sides of the streets and actually would talk to him and say, nice tune, right? And so it totally changed their perspective. And all he did was whistle. So the power of a whistle can change your perspective. The power in this work, there's a lot more that we can change. Also, one of the things that I found is that when you become aware of these mindsets in your own mindset, and more importantly, that other people have a different mindset, it becomes much easier to converse with them in a way that produces something productive. So it's very, very helpful in that regard. But let's go to this example, and I think you'll find it amusing as we go along. So I want to talk about two different kinds of people, and I'm going to characterize both sets. And then I'm going to ask you who you think you are. The first group of people, status is one of the most important things to them. It's a defining quality, if you will. And you might say, well, why is status so important? And, and where you sit in the hierarchy of the organization? Well, if you look at it from a hierarchy perspective, where you sit in the hierarchy dictates how hard it is or how easy it is to get work done. And so that's a really important piece, particularly in the work world. The second characteristic is independence. And independence to this group is of the utmost importance. It's highly prized. This group wants to be able to control what they do, how they do it, and when they do it. And by the way, they don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> they want to maintain their independence and their freedom, sometimes at all costs. Now, if you ask this group, is status and independence really important to you? You will find the answer. They won't, they would never say yes to that because they don't think that way. This mindset is it's buried in the back of your mind. And actually, the person who came off with the status and independence piece is uh, Deborah Tannen. She's a professor at Georgetown University, and she studied men and women and boys and girls for years and years and years. But she gleaned all this not from what they say, 
but from the actions that they take, the behaviors that they exhibit, and how they speak, right? She's a linguist, so how they speak became really important. So they would never say, you know, status and independence is the most important thing, but if you watch their behavior, it's what you'll see. Let's call this group independent-minded. Now, let's flip over and look at the other group. And in this particular group, connection is one of the most important things. Like status is to that group, connection is to this group. They thrive on connection. The second characteristic for this group is interdependence. The more interdependent, the more you require other people to get your work done, the better it is. And so interdependence is very important. And of course, relationships are also going to be very important to this group because it, it's part of the connection and interdependence piece. And when you look at hierarchy for this group, they actually prefer a flat hierarchy compared to a raised hierarchy because it puts everybody on a level playing field and you can all contribute. So now let me ask the question. Oh, this group is called community minded. Now let me ask the question with these two groups of people and we'll do it in the chat. Which way do you mean? Are you independent or community minded? Let's see what we have in the room. Hmm. I, I confess while everyone's typing in their thing, I confess that I'm kind of straddling both, but I'm going to lean toward independent. Okay. Okay. Any other takers? Let's see what else. We've got Zane is independent. independent. Chris is community. Megan, I think I'm both and it creates conflict. I'm with you, Megan. Rosemary, independent. Brian, independent. Nicola, community biased. Uh, Sitlali, independent. Renee, independent, mostly. And I like, you know, some of, mostly. I think I lean in this direction. So, um, yeah, I like, I do like Megan's response. That's, that's, that's really pretty good. So, yeah, and Rosemary's like, I agree with Megan after hearing her response. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Now, what happens when you put both of these different kinds of people in the workplace? You get conflict. Sometimes you get overt conflict, like you see these people in this meeting, I swear they're about to come to blows, <laughs> right? which is, you know, not very good um, professional behavior. But a lot of times you don't see the conflict so high, it's buried, it's buried deep, but you'll hear it. People will leave meetings saying, boy, I'm not sure how they arrived at that conclusion. I wonder what they really thought about did they factor in this information or that information? And you'll hear people grumbling that they don't understand how, how things got to be the way they are. But the conflict is there. And if we don't resolve some of these conflicts, you can run into lots of issues. Let me show you another way that mindsets show up that I think is uh, fun and can be hilarious. And it can be very off-putting as well. I don't know if you guys remember, but you know, we used to go to conferences. I love conferences. This is a picture of me at a conference. I must have been two years ago now, right? But have you ever been to a conference and been happily networking and chatting away with people? And you realize that the person that you're talking to is not really listening to you. They're looking around the room. They're scanning the room. Has that ever happened to you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jennifer says yes. Anybody else? Sure. I've never been to a conference. Okay, we'll happen to you. Don't worry. And welcome, Sarah. Sarah's a community minded, just like Chris is. Yay. Okay. Megan says yes. She's Megan said yes. Mm -hmm. So this kind of thing happens. Let's dig into what's going on deeper inside when we look at this. If you're independent minded and status is the most important thing to you, then what should you be doing at one of these big conferences? And you know, it might be a 
it might be an industry conference where you're meeting with people from a lot of other companies or it might even be a company meeting but you know you've got a lot of people there that you may not normally interact with right so there's a there's usually a lot of new people around what should you be doing if status is most important to you uh, and you should be doing exactly what they're doing is building connections and looking for people of higher status that they should go meet because this is an opportunity to meet those kinds of people, right? Mm -hmm. Brian's got it. Building connections. Yep. But if you think about the community minded, they're there, they're trying to build connections. But when you're trying to build connections and somebody else is ignoring you, how does that make you feel? Oh, pretty crappy. Yeah, not 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 too good. So, and you got to realize that neither one of these styles is right or wrong. They're very different. And if there were only one type of person, we wouldn't have any of these conflicts because everybody would be doing the same thing. It's not unusual to see a bunch of independent-minded people at a conference, and they're all looking around to see who else they should go meet while acting like they're speaking to each other. And it kind of cracks me up sometimes. But when they're all independent-minded, they're all doing the same thing. It's only when we start behaving differently because we have a different mindset that these conflicts start to appear. So I spent many years collecting all these differences in how people respond. And I wanted to show you this particular uh, set of dichotomies on the status and connection and independence versus interdependence. But when I wrote my book, I have more than 20 of these things in my book. I said, oh, this is too much to just, you know, to just put out there as a big blob. So I said, you got to be able to characterize these somehow. And I took them all literally and I spread them out on the floor. And I, I found, I did find three subcategories within these that made really good sense. And the subcategories are, how do you perceive the world? And those include the two that we just talked about. But there were two other categories I discovered. How do you process information? How do you think in your head? How do you think? And then the second category is what do you value? Now, what I'd like to do is go into how we process information and, and talk about that for a minute. I'd like to give you two examples from each of those next two categories so you kind of get a better feel for the framework. Have you ever said to someone else, I need to think about it? I think we've all done that. I, I would guess there's not a person who's here that hasn't said, oh, you know, I need to think about that. Yeah. But what we do when we think about that is a very different thing than what other people might do. So I wanted to look at how do we do this with problem solving. And what happens with problem solving, let me ask you, when you first encounter a problem, what's the first thing that you do? Do you sit down and think about it by yourself? Or do you go out and talk about it with a bunch of people in order to formulate your thoughts? So let me call them thinkers and talkers, right? We'll that make it easier in the chat. So put in the chat whether you're a thinker or a talker when you're problem solving. I'm a talker. Sarah's a thinker. Zane is a thinker. Think first, then talk. Love that, Zane. Megan is a thinker. <clears throat> Renee is a researcher. And you know what? I agree with that. He can he can solve any problem because he researches it. Uh, Nicola, thinker. Sitlali, thinker. Rosemary, talker. Chris, I usually think about it first and then I talk. I ask someone for GTS or, or, or Google that shit. I know what that is. I ask someone or Google that shit. <laughs> and then Renee says he thinks he's a thinker now. <laughs> respond very differently and they're working in the way that's their natural style which is going to make them better doing it their way right this is not a case where you want to do it my way because it will mess up someone if that's if that's not the way that they're used to doing that right so when we do this problem solving we can do it very differently 
And but nobody even talks about that. So the the dichotomy that we're looking at here is independent versus collaborative kind of thinking. And people really fall into one camp or another. But what do you do as a leader at a company when you've got both kinds of groups and you've got problems to be solved? How do you get the most out of people? Well, one of the things that you can do is, you know, grab the people who are involved, sit down and explain the problem, then stop the meeting and reschedule the next meeting where you're going to do problem solving, like the next day or maybe a few hours later. It depends on the urgency of the issue. Because what that does is allows both your different kinds of thinkers to go out and think in the way that works best for them. Then when they come back together in a problem solving mode, they're all prepared. Because if you force people into doing things without them having a chance to think about it, they won't move forward and you're not going to be as productive. You know, I learned part of this with one of my bosses and I used to, I used to like to say, I'm a, let's go introduce this new concept. And of course, you know, I was the eater beaver, right? And I said, let me explain it to him and he'll approve it and we'll move forward right away. Like one step, you know, the one step answer. And it took many trials before I figured this out. But every time I would offer something up like this, he would go, I, you know, Karen, I need to think about that. And I finally went, okay. And so then I shifted my strategy and I said, I'm going to go in and I'm going to introduce the concept to them. I'm going to come back two or three days later and I'm going to add some more details because now he's had time to think about it and he can actually absorb the details better because he's starting to get a framework in his mind. He was an independent thinker. Mm -hmm. I'm a collaborative thinker. And so I finally figured out a way that made it work for both of us. And that's what's really important here. It's about, uh, switching your style and adjusting yourself so everyone can contribute as, to the best of their ability, if you will. All right, let's move on. And there's another category within how do we process information? And that's how do we deal with information? So let me ask you a question. Do you barter or do you share information at work? Do you barter information or do you share it at work? Okay, Jennifer is a sharer. Share, share, share. Oh, we got the share team here. Yay, share. <laughs> but you know, I to right. to the to that answer, I remembered working at a company where this one particular guy that I had to work with was a barterer and it drove me nuts. Because it was like, dude, I'm supposed to be tracking all the processes for this company. Why aren't you giving me this information? And it felt, I felt like I was dealing with someone who was a lord of his own fiefdom. Megan said, "Barter drives me nuts too." So you are, you are in, you are in good company. <laughs> but, but think about where does this come from? So the the dichotomy is, you know, bartering versus sharing. And, and I used information as an example, but there might be many other things that you could use as an example here. If you think about it, information is power. And if you're independent minded and you have the information, then you have all the status, right? This information is obviously valuable. So you would never give it away. And that's kind of the key to unlocking some of this is to understand that the, the person's motivation. The community minded, on the other hand, think very differently about this. They think that information is power, but only when it's in the hands of the people who really need to use it. And so some of these people share information liberally. They cope the world with their information. And you may know them if you're an independent uh, thinking person, because you might wonder why they're sharing so much information with you. Well, they want to make sure that who needs it has it at their fingertips when they need it. And so that's a very different style that gets used with those two pieces of information. And like you, Jennifer, I have a couple of funny stories about um, the barter versus share, because I'm very independent minded, except on this one, I am all the way over on the community side, and I'm a total sharer. I have people come in to my division of a company 
would be coming from another division and we had some practices that the other groups didn't have and so on this new person coming in you know i offered i think i'd like to give you this information and i've had them looked at me very confused and i even have people go why are you telling me this with suspicion <laughs> like you're doing something wrong here because you're telling me this and i think they really think the information was valuable but they had no idea why i was just handing it to them i've had other people with an even funnier response i've had people look at me and say I don't need your help. <laughs> you know, at the time, I was young, and you know that was really what I heard was, "I don't need your help." Yep. But I think what they really meant was, "I don't need help. I don't need anybody's help. Yours, anybody's. Not about you. It's I don't need help. I'm independent. I can do this by myself." So what what's happening here is how we process information and how we deal with it can actually get in the way of work. And most of the time, people do not have any idea what caused the conflict. You know that they're banging heads with someone else on. They don't. They never go to the deeper level and said, well, "Where did that come from?" And the worst is when you look at productivity in the workplace. You know, this guy that I offered this information to us three months that we danced around each other because you know there was this whole not trust thing going on until he finally figured out that I could be trustworthy and then we became the best of friends and buds and shared all kinds of information. I just saw a question. Oh yeah, it's Megan. What type of question reveals a barterer if I am screening someone to be on my team? Great question, Megan. You know, I, I think you can just ask them, how, how do you deal with information? Right? Because, and, and even if they're a bar, that doesn't mean you don't want them on your team. You may just need to say, hey, you know, here we believe, you know, it's about, it's about the culture. Here we believe that sharing and supporting all our team members is the most important thing. And so we, you know, share information liberally. Right, because if, if somebody has a natural style, it usually doesn't mean that they can't go in a different direction. Thank you, Megan, for responding. So I kind of know that I'm because I'm, you know, looking at a bunch of names. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate that a lot. So, and when these things happen, you want to resolve them as quickly as possible, right? So that people can get back to work if you will right because that's really important let me give you we've been through now how we process information and we talked about independent versus collaborative on problem solving and we talked about bartering versus sharing uh in terms of information as our example but let's move into the third category and the third category uh, is what we value what we hold dear and what's important and why is it important? You know, why are values important to work? You guys can type something in the chat. Well, we've got a question from Nicola. Are barters or sharers more successful in business? Big Tech, for example, seems to be in a bartering club, given how Amazon and Google hoard and hide their information on AI. But then, but then you have to be careful, you know, you be careful here in the bartering or sharing, but you know what's going on in AI is you know proprietary information, right? And so that's you know is that your competitive advantage? That's true. Well, also it's, too, a, you know, there's a line there that says you know that's about business. So most of the barter, but but I agree with you that big tech companies. Well, who do you think runs a lot of big tech companies? Are they independent or community minded? Oh, good question. But Google has all the free software, all the free tools, Google Docs, Google Spreadsheets, Google Maps. There's like so much good community minded stuff that goes into Google, for example. Right. OK. Apple said that you know, they're independent minded. So and now would say that you know, their likelihood would be to barter it. Because if you take something that's valuable and you just share it freely, then you've made it free mm -hmm. and you. It's value. 
But a lot of this depends on how you think about these things. So it can be really, um, it can be really interesting. I love this interaction of questions. This is great, by the way. Keep it going. So, <laughs> but your values determine your priorities. And that's kind of always been the case. And what you're doing, how you're doing it, right, is, is part of how the values are. Because you can be doing something that you really enjoy, but you're doing it in a way that you don't enjoy, and then it's not valuable, right? I mean, we can all work hard, but if we were pushed to work 24 hours a day, right, we, we all become brain dead. So that doesn't, you know, that doesn't work either. Mm -hmm. And when, when what you're doing and how you're doing syncs with your values, you feel good. You feel satiated. You're satisfied. One of the things our brain does is when we're, when we're in cognitive dissonance, that's when you have a conflict between your attitudes, your beliefs, and your behaviors. That they're not all in alignment. Something is, is a little bit out of alignment. Your brain will keep working to try to bring alignment up. And this, by the way, is part of what wakes you up at three o'clock in the morning, because your brain knows things are not in alignment, and so it slings problems at you in the middle of the night while you're asleep, uh, trying to get better alignment. In terms of values, one of the things that um, we look at is bonding, because bonding at work is really important. And when people are bonded together, uh, when they're very comfortable with each other, they can do they can be so much more productive. Now, I'm going to show you a very quick, it's like a one minute video on bonding. Oh, wow. Okay. That was a cool illustration, Karen. That is done with Doodly, by the way, which is really kind of a fun, uh, fun little software, but it requires you to mentally figure out how to get the message, right? delivered so that's cool uh, it can be a challenge but i've had quite a good time i've got two or three of those i've created so thank nice. you Jennifer. Mm -hmm. so when we're trying to design a bonding activity how do we do it so it meets everybody's needs one of the things that i'd like to do is have us brainstorm some ways in which we could design bonding exercises that meet both of these needs and there are things they can get in conflict within each one of these categories. Let me give you an example. So the community-minded and bonding use self-depreciating humor. So they pick on themselves. But they don't pick on themselves about little things. They tend to pick on themselves about big, substantial things. And they say, you know, I'm not very good at that. They, you know, they depreciate themselves. And they do that to keep their hierarchy flat. They never want to say, I'm, I'm higher, I'm better than you. They do it to keep the hierarchy flat and to say, you know, we're all in the same boat. That's one of their messages. And that message works really well for similar community-minded people. But when you take that self-depreciating humor message and you send it in to the independent-minded brain, they go, well, you don't really think very much of yourself, do you? I won't either. And therein lies the problem. Again, we've crossed mindsets. And so what one group is doing in one mindset, which is trying to keep a level playing field and make sure everybody's on an equal footing, ends up in the other mindset having a different connotation. And so all this plays out in the background, and I will hazard to guess that none of you have had a conversation ever about this in the workplace, except maybe Megan. She might have. 
But most people, this conversation doesn't, this, this wouldn't happen. <laughs> I like novels. Chaos is what happens. Yeah, yeah happens. for sure. So let's take a few minutes and talk about, and I guess we'll do this through the chat with, uh, with Jennifer's big help. What kinds of activities could you use to do bonding when you've got both sets of people in your group? Mm, I would I would start off by uh, having food together, sharing a meal. That's good. No, I got a cookout. Somebody. Yeah, Zane, cookout. Brian, cookout. Yeah, especially with Brian's cooking, I want some of that some of that food he's got. Share your regrets. Ooh, Nicola, that's a good one. Brilliant. Food, food is, is the best, best bonder. Food mm -hmm. is very is a very is a good bonder. But what other kinds of things could you do? to get people communicating and to get people to understand each other better. A dance class. <laughs> I'm a you little... know, that's good because you might be putting everybody in the same boat at the same time. Even if all of them are, okay, I worked with a lot of dirty engineers my whole career, right? You know, that would put everyone at the same level of comfort or uncomfort, if you will. Mm -hmm. Act throwing. I don't know, Brian, I'll have to talk about that. <laughs> Dangerous, but you'd have to know my teenage boys to know that. <laughs> River rafting. Oh yeah, Renee. River rafting. That's so true. Getting people outdoors might be a really good way, and it's and it, and it doesn't hit you know either of these two things. Teach things to each other. By the way, that would help. It's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, also for mentoring, when I very early in my career, we we started. Um, a mentoring program when we had, you know, junior engineers who were good with personal computers at the time, work with the senior leadership team who was still printing out their emails and writing down to their secretary what they wanted to type back in. You gotta love you gotta, you gotta love that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the 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 junior engineers got business expertise, but they also coach some of the senior leadership team into ways that they could be more effective with their personal computers when personal computers were new. Nice. Now I really did date myself, didn't I? Nah, we all we all had personal computers at one point. Yeah, they were they, they, at least you know I thank goodness for them. Imagine how hard it would be to do work. Right. All right, let's move forward and let's talk about risk. Risk is the final area that I wanted to talk about, and there are many studies that talk about risk. Unfortunately, they they all, all the studies that I've seen have divided people up in men or women. So I'm going to talk right now, if you'll forgive me, and use men and women because that's the how the studies were actually done. Uh, Sally Krawcheck is a famous Wall Street investor and now has her own uh, investment firm. But she wrote this book a couple of years ago called Own It. It's, it's quite a good book, by the way. And what she found was that women are more risk aware than men. And she got some of this information in, you know, looking at the returns of startups. And what she found from the data was startups that had more women on their management teams got much better results. And of course, this has been proven out over and over again that, you know, these mixed teams are, are going to give you better results. Helen Fisher also wrote a book called The First Sex. And in this book, she looked at investment clubs, right? people deal with risk. And um, I don't know if you're aware, but there are, are investment clubs that are for men and investment clubs that are for women, so that well, they're segregated, if you will. And what Helen found, looking at the same time period, at the same stock market, everybody had the same opportunity, is that women's returns came in at 21%, while the men-only clubs came in at 15%. Now, being, you know, a finance person, right? She looks at this and she says, hmm. And they look deep inside and they said, well, the men had taken so much riskier investments and it was the loss on those investments that caused the men's uh, overall percentage 
to go down. So risk is a really interesting uh, thing that happens. And what I've gleaned from them is the independent minded are bold and daring in their risk, while the community minded are more calculated in the risk and the amount of risk that they're willing to take. There's also a couple of interesting perspectives that you can add into this. If a man takes a risk and fails, many people will say, oh, he's just having a bad day. It had nothing to do with him. He's having a bad day. The outside world has influenced him into a bad day. But if a woman takes a risk and it fails, she's just that way. And you may find that you will see this in a lot of other areas where how you look at things, and, and this is an internal versus external perspective, you know, with, with the men being bold and daring, you know, it wasn't their fault. It was a bad thing. It, it was just a bad thing. It, but, but with the women, it was their fault. So that's an internal versus external look of who's at fault or who's responsible. And people apply different rules depending on your sex. Look for this in the future. You might be amused to see what you find. Finally, there's one more thing with risk, and it's about stress. You know, the stress uh, hormone is cortisol, and it floods our system when, you know, the, the, the uh, the terms get jacked up and we're all ready to go. But cortisol has a very different reaction in men and in women. And they discovered that when they've done some studies on this. When men receive, you know, a jolt of cortisol, they become more risk seeking. They will take bigger risks. When women are operating with a lot of cortisol in their system, they become more risk aware and they are more likely to take the sure win than to take the risky adventure. So now think about that as you ask people to say, you know, this is happening. What would you do? Look at the level of stress that they're under and look at who they are as you factor, you know, their input into you because you may be hearing they believe that this factor was a big piece of what happened in Rwanda. Right, they drove themselves further and further, and as the stress got higher and higher, they took more and more risks. Women would back away from that, and men embraced that risk, and and that can lead you into trouble if it goes too far. As we all know what happened with Enron. Mm. Wow. Let me do a quick summary on what we value. We've talked about uh, bonding. And we've talked about risk and how those two characteristics go. Now, what I'd like to do is give you a very quick wrap up. Wrap up. And what I'm showing here on all these charts are all the dichotomies in my book. And you'll see that I've circled the ones that we've gone over because there's quite a few uh, additional ones that can add clarity to your life. So we looked at in terms of perceptions. We looked at status versus connection and independence versus interdependence. And in terms of how we process information, right, how we see the world, we looked at independent versus collaborative using problem solving as a technique. And we looked at borrowing and sharing using information as our example for that. And then when we get to value, we did the bonding and we did the risk and what we value. And you can see there are many more um, steps involved in that. There are three steps that you can take to really leverage gender differences. The first is to explore your own, your own perceptions, your own processing differences and your own values. Figure out where you are. Then you can start looking outward and look at how people start with those that are closest to you that you know that you work with a lot right your boss your peers um, if you have people working for you and say what are you know where are these people on these different scales and then you can start talking about it and you can help others see these things and see what's actually the conflict which usually frees things up and allows people to really become more and more productive 
The other thing I want to warn you about, and I've um, found this with a lot of people, is it's situational. So if you look at one of these characteristics on how you are at home, you might find you're very different at work. So you might have some different personalities where you switch back and forth, whether you're at home or at work. And so you might want to look in both places to see how you respond. And it may be different. Quite a few people have shown differences in this area. So uh, it can be uh, situational if you will. But when you start talking about these things, you can really open up conversations and get to the real issues at hand and uh, have a much more productive work environment. In closing, my goal is to change corporate America so everyone is more comfortable to contribute and so everyone's contributions actually come into play. I am happy to share this presentation at your workplaces if you're interested in that or to talk with you offline. I think Jennifer has my contact information and things. And Jennifer, if you could put that in the chat, people will be able to get a hold of me because I'm always delighted to talk to people uh, to make the workplace more smooth because yes. I've been through quite a few bumps in my career and I'd like other people not to have to go through all that. Thank you. Oh my goodness, of course. This is great. Oh my gosh, everybody. Uh, can you take yourselves off of mute so we can so Karen can hear you through my phone? Uh, how how um, uh, there's some great messages too. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Claps intensively. Yay, Nicola. He's totally clapping. Yay, clapping. Awesome. I know. I think this needs to be a future rock star squad meeting discussion. I think it's so cool. Like, how does everyone think? Um, awesome. Applause, applause. Um, truly some great stuff. So let's get back into active cameras, everybody. Activate your camera and uh, let's, um, let's show Karen that we're having a good old time. And you guys can take yourself off mute now because that way she can hear you and we can have conversation. Zane, I'm so glad you're here, buddy. It's so great having you. Megan, everybody. So what did you guys think of this? Was this helpful? Does this help you understand your spouse, your coworkers, your boss, like everybody else in your whole world? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right? Right? And, and, and if anybody has questions, you know, this is an area that's fraught with places to trip. <laughs> right? How many of us like feel like you straddle the lines between both? Like I have, hey Dave. Oh, we're gonna bring. Yeah, Dave straddles the lines. Megan straddles. Yeah, Nicola. Like yeah, Rosemary for sure. Like it, we all we all have like areas where we cross over. Like you said earlier, Karen. Like there are certain things where you're very independent minded, but then on this one, you're community minded and sharing. Yeah. And is there, are there, is that where we get tripped up that we think that we're in one category, but we're behaving in another and we think that somebody no, else. I think more, more, and now we might trip other people up with that when we switch, right? I mean, if I, let's say I take off with a group of people from work on a camping trip with our families, are you using your work brain or your home brain then? Mm -hmm. And so you might switch, but there's no sign that said, oh, Karen switched. She's now being really community minded, not independent minded. And so it can leave people with scratch in their head. But more often than not, what happens is, you know, you have your mindset and you believe everybody else has the same mindset. And so when somebody has a different mindset, that's when you crash into each other. And But you never talk about the mindset. You end up talking about whatever hit the floor when your mindset is collided, right? Which is not the actual problem, right? So you need to kind of get down to, wait a minute, where did we disconnect? Because then you can reconnect and, and rebuild from that. Yeah. Well, you know what? We're, we're in our last five minutes, and this is perfect timing, Dave, that you're here, because I was actually going to have Karen tell the fun story about how she knows you how we're all linked together and Karen if you don't mind um, telling telling everybody about your background with Dave and then and then your uh, recent interaction finding out about um, Rockstar Marketing. Oh this is hilarious right so 
I had no idea that Jennifer knew Dave, right? Now, I know Dave because he helps build sets for the school play at the elementary school that his wife works at. And apparently, I think, I don't know, 25 years have you been building these sets? That's something like that. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's a long time. You might think, oh, building sets, and you're thinking like little cardboard things for little kids. And we, <laughs> that's what I thought. But, you know, when I showed up to help work in the set crew the first time, this is this play is done in a full on theater. So these sets all go up and down. And the first, I think, set of sets that I had to build was uh, the Warbucks Mansion for Annie. And it was 40 feet wide, it covered the entire stage, and it was marbled with gold lines. And it was crazy. Anyway, Dave's one of the best construction builders I know. Then, flash forward many years, I meet Jennifer. And I'm like, oh, this is great. And I said, well, Jennifer, you know, I know that she works with, you know, auto body shops and stuff. And I said, Jennifer, I, I know this great guy you should talk to. He's Dave. And so I sent, you know, an email over to Dave and said, you know, you need to work with Jennifer. And of course it comes back and he says, I already am, Karen. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> so it's a small world, folks. It's a really small world. I know, right? It is a small world. talking tomorrow, is that right? Yes, Dave's talking tomorrow and we're super excited because he is, he's such a badass, just as Karen is a badass, Dave is a badass, and he is going to be talking about all the different associations that he, he has belonged to. One of my favorite stories about Dave is that um, I, when I was relatively new to, well, actually it was my very first conference, I went to the Vision Conference, and I was, I was meeting, uh, Dave, Dave and I were sharing a booth. And there's a gentleman that is a very well-known uh, coach in the industry. And uh, it was, uh, Dave Dave was my defender. Um, this person was asking me to speed things up. And I would, Dave, you probably remember this. And uh, so Cecil was like, um, I hear that your waiting line is long for their work, but you're going to put my people first. And I said, no, we're very fair. We take everybody in first come, first serve, and we're going to be, we're going to be doing this as quickly as we can, but you're you're not um, going to be jumping in front of anybody else in line. And uh, so Cecil said something to the effect of, um, well, then I'm just going to have to look for somebody else to do the work. And I said, okay, if that's what you need to do. And Dave just said, Cecil, she just told you she's the best. <laughs> Dave, I love you. Anyway, he's going to be talking tomorrow about the different associations. Dave, do you want to take yourself off mute and kind of like give everybody a little preview of what you're going to be doing? Because auto repair folks need to definitely show up for tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I'm, I was looking for a picture from the play. So sorry for that. I'm, there it is. He wants proof of those sets, huh? See that? Oh, that is a big set. Can you guys it's see that? It's huge. That's oh, beautiful. Nice. <laughs> How many hours did that take? Oh, oh, hundreds. <laughs> more than more than anybody could count, right, Karen? Through January for like four to six hours. This is no small truth. <laughs> and it's dozens of people involved. Yeah, it's a big deal. So yeah, it was interesting when Karen said, you need to meet Jen. I said, I know Jen. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, um, I just wanted to talk tomorrow about the importance of your industry association. So um, hopefully I'll bring some value to everybody and uh, uh, make sense to, to sign up for your association. And if you're an automotive, ASCCA is the place for you if you're in California. Yay. So Dave, yeah. there's Brian Gillis. He's another coach. You two haven't met already. You two definitely need to talk. Zane is a, a wonderful service advisor at Jeff's Automotive up in Pennsylvania. He's very active. Um, Megan, thanks for being here. Um, Rosemary is an attorney. Rosemary, I would assume that you're an attorney, you have to belong to the various associations such as the bar. Yep, yep, she has to, it's her job. <laughs> yes, yeah. But the yeah. Trial Lawyers Association and all these things. Yeah, I'm going to a seminar right after this. Here, so. Oh, very good. Yeah. Very good. 
Well, it is the top of the hour. Everybody, I'm so happy that you guys came and saw Karen just knock it out of the park. I'm sure we're all going to be like questioning. How do I think? How does my spouse think? How do my coworkers think? Oh, okay. And for the squad members on this call, Sitlali, Nicola, Chris, Renee, Right. And even even Brian, we're going to definitely like have a whole session about like, like, how does how do we all think? Because it'd be really cool to see how do we all find that we fit into this mindset because it will help us unlock the key. Because, yeah, Chris is definitely community minded. He's amazing in that regard. And Renee is definitely the researcher. We all have our superpowers. Right. So you all have a beautiful rest of your day tomorrow. Show up at the same time, 11 a.m. Pacific. Well, one, two, two o'clock Eastern uh, tomorrow. It's going to be at the same time every day and great speakers day tomorrow. And then we've got marketing with Sarah Frazier on Wednesday, Angie Lopez on Thursday, and Dr. Jenny Lynn on Friday. So love you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Karen. Bye. Bye. Thank you.